You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Phillips Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello everyone and welcome to A Bible Answer. I'm Mike McDaniel, the evangelist of the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville, Missouri. Thanks for watching A Bible Answer today. We have three gospel preachers to serve as panelists today and we'll have them introduce themselves to you at this time. Hello, I'm Hal Ferguson. I'm the Director of Extension Studies of the World Bible Institute in McDonough, Georgia. Hello, I am Nat Evans. I preach for the Hickory Grove Church of Christ at Alamo, Kentucky. Hello, I'm Adam Evans. I just returned back to the United States from Tanzania, East Africa, uh, doing mission work there. And I'm now uh, the gospel preacher at the Valdosta Church of Christ in Tuscumbia, Alabama. We're grateful that each of these brethren could be with us today to answer your questions, and we're very happy that you're watching. Please tell other people about a Bible answer and where it may be seen in your area. And our first question today goes to Brother Ferguson. Brother Ferguson, how would you begin a Bible study with a person who does not believe in God or that the Bible is the Word of God? Brother Ferguson. Thank you for this question. I think in most cases before a Bible study could ever be uh, entered into, uh, one would have to, learn, have to gain the confidence of a person, uh, whether a person is a believer in God or not. And so I think uh, first of all, by our lives and our examples and showing the love of Christ, uh, compassion, uh, long-suffering, uh, we would want to try to encourage them to see that uh, a belief in God and the Christian life is the, truly the best life one can lead. Um, Jesus said, The thief cometh not but for to, to kill and to steal and to destroy, but I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly, John 10, verse 10. But for a person who does not believe in God, an atheist, um, I think if he would listen and if he would sit down and to discuss the subject um, seriously, uh, objectively, uh, I think there are a number of approaches that one could use. And I think what I would do and have done in the, in the past would, first of all, I would try to help that person to understand the kind of world that would exist if there were no God. And first of all, uh, a world without God would be, frankly, a world that would not exist because everything that exists has a cause. And there's no such thing as an uncaused cause in a natural world, it doesn't exist. But God, by the very essence and nature of His existence, is the only uncaused cause. And uh, if you deny God, then you deny your own existence, which is absurd, of course. But secondly, a world without God would be a world without design. Uh, there would be no systems, no laws, no order, no languages, no patterns, no codes, no universals, and therefore no outcome of anything rational or understandable. Uh, and of course, there's no such thing as an unintelligent design or pattern or code or language. But third, a world without God would be a world without morals. Uh, there'd be no cause for acting in any kind of good or moral way or for any good moral reason. Because if man is the mere product of a non-intelligent, non-moral universe, the morality has no beginning place. It has no birthplace. Dirt and rocks have no feelings or emotions. A phosphorus fire feels no remorse when a human body is burnt beyond recognition. And so trying to help him to see a world where there would be no God, it would not be, first of all, a world that would exist. It would not be a world of any order and it would certainly not be a very kind world. Uh, but as to the person who does not believe in the inspiration of the scriptures, I would then encourage that person and direct them to, uh, first of all, perhaps Bible prophecies, their fulfillment, for example, the prophecy concerning the city of Tyre in Ezekiel chapter 26, verses one through five is an example, uh, an excellent example to see the fulfillment of a prophecy that would have been impossible to be fulfilled by human knowledge. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream of a great image in Daniel chapter 2, or Isaiah's giving details of the destruction of Babylon by the Medes in, uh, 
in Isaiah chapter 13, or in the naming of Cyrus the Persian in Isaiah 44 and 45, the prophecies of Daniel, and then particularly I would focus on the prophecies concerning Jesus Christ and His last days and hours of His life, His death, His burial, and especially His resurrection and concerning what happened to the body of Christ. There are no answers to what happened to Jesus' body except that God raised Him from the dead. And then, of course, the integrity of the Bible as an accurate and truthful uh, book written over the course of 1,500 years by 40 different authors of varying backgrounds on three continents, uh, on a host of different subjects, and yet they all uh, are unified in such a remarkable way, unlike any book that has ever been known. The manuscript evidence uh, for the New Testament is absolutely overwhelming. In fact, in the New Testament, there are over 5,000 manuscripts and manuscript pieces um, that uh, support our uh, translations of the New Testament to this very day. There are over 3,000 minuscule fragments, ancient versions, quotes from the church fathers, lectionaries. In fact, uh, it has been said, uh, truthfully, that if we did not have any Bibles or any manuscripts or any of the fragments of the Bible to this day, that we could reproduce nearly the entire New Testament merely on the quotations from the early church fathers. In fact, the verdict is this. The Greek text from which we derive our New Testament uh, translations uh, is 99.5% uh, pure. And so it proves the words that Jesus spoke in Matthew 25 and verse 36. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. And so these would be some ways and, and areas in which I think I would like to begin and hopefully that they would be helpful to bring in such a person to the knowledge of Christ. Thank you for your good question. Yes, we're glad for that good question and that great answer. Very good. Now to Brother Ned Evans. What is the meaning of the regeneration referred to in Matthew 19.28, Brother Evans? Let me begin by reading this passage from the American Standard Version. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you that ye who have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of His glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. The times of regeneration refers to the time of the new birth, John chapter 3, verses 3 and 5, namely the time of the present Christian dispensation, when men are hearing the gospel of Christ and obeying it, Romans 1, 16 and 17. Christ, my friends, is now reigning over His spiritual kingdom, the church. This reign will continue till all enemies have been put under His feet, 1 Corinthians 15, 24 to 28. When death, the last enemy, is destroyed, Christ will not then initiate a earthly reign but he will end his present spiritual reign where he's at the right hand of God. The phrase 12 thrones refers to the authority of the apostles through the means of their inspired teaching, John 14, 26, John 16, 13, and 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. The 12 tribes of Israel represent the new Israel of God, the church of Christ, Romans 2, 28, 29, Galatians 3, 27 through 29, and Galatians chapter 6, verse 16. We would note that the word regeneration is used only one other time in the New Testament, and that is in Titus 3, 5. Here it is, the washing of regeneration, which refers to baptism in water in conversion, Acts 10, 47 and 48, Ephesians 5, 26, John 3, 3 and 5. The regeneration belongs to the period of time between the day of Pentecost and the final coming of Christ to judge the world. It is the time of the church when the laws of the new birth is a law of spiritual increase in Christ's kingdom, Mark 16, 15 and 16, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned or condemned. 
During this period of time, the Son of Man sits on the throne of His glory at the right hand of God. Acts 2, Hebrews 1, 3, Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 1, and Revelation 3, 21. Jesus now sits at the right hand of God, reigning over His spiritual kingdom, the church. Thank you for this good question. Thank you, Brother Evans. We've reached the halfway point of our program today. We want to offer you this free tract. Our tract is entitled, The Lord's Church is Different. If you'd like to have this tract, or if you'd like to study the Bible in your home using our free eight-lesson Bible correspondence course, or to send us your question, just contact us. Write us at Phillip Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. You may email us at a Bible answer at earthlink.net, or you may call our toll-free number 1-800-436-0463. You can also contact us by means of our web address, and that web address is www.abibleanswertv.org. If you go to our website, we've got a contact page there, and you can use that as well. Back to our questions today, to Brother Adam Evans for his first question today on a Bible answer. How does one grieve the Holy Spirit? Brother Evans. Thank you for this good question. Let's begin by reading the text in Ephesians chapter 4 and in verse 30. It says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. When we sin against God, we grieve the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is a part of the Godhead. And so when we sin against, uh, when we sin against God, of which the Holy Spirit is a part, then we grieve Him. When we rebel against Almighty God, we grieve the Holy Spirit. In Isaiah chapter 63, verses 7 through 10, it says, I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord hath bestowed on us and the great goodness toward the house of Israel, which He hath bestowed on them according to His mercies and according to the multitude of his loving kindness. For he said, Surely they are my people, children that will not lie. So he was their Savior, and in all their affliction he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. And in his love and in his pity he redeemed them. And he bare them and carried them all the days of the old, verse 10, but they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy, and he fought against them. We also see in Psalm 78 and verse 40, how oft did they provoke him in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert. And also in Psalm 95, verse 8 through 11, it says, Harden not your heart as in the provocation. And in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me and saw my work. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation and said, it is a people that do err in their heart and they have not known my ways unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. When we actually go back and look at the text in Ephesians chapter 4 and we consider the context, we see that in the context in verse 29, that filthy conversation uh, would be something that would grieve the Holy Spirit. But we also see several other sins that would grieve the Holy Spirit. In verse 30, we have bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, and all malice. In verse 25, we have lying. In verse 26, we have wrath. And in verse 28, we have stealing. And so when we rebel against God, when we sin against God, then the Holy Spirit of Almighty God is grieved. Thank you for this good question. Thank you. To Brother Ferguson, this question, what is Paul talking about in 2 Corinthians 12, 16 when he said, I caught you with guile? Brother Ferguson. Well, thank you for this good question. I'd like to look at the context that this passage is found in. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning with verse 14, Paul writes, Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. 
and I will very gladly spin and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I am loved. But be it so, I did not burden you. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you with guile. Did I make a gain of you by any of them whom I sent unto you? I desire Titus, and with him I sent a brother. Did Titus make a gain of you? Walked we not in the same spirit? Walked we not in the same steps? A large part of this letter to the Corinthians, Paul is defending uh, himself against critics who were questioning his apostleship, uh, charging him of being less um, authoritative or be less of an apostle than the other apostles, like maybe Peter. And also they seem to be accusing him of being a hireling, of accept or, or taking money uh, from churches and being deceptive and taking money uh, but not being really concerned for uh, the churches. Well, to prevent from making this false charge, Paul refuses to receive support from the Corinthians. And yet that didn't seem to be enough for them because verse 16, it appears that some twisted Paul's refusal to take money. And he said that this was simply just Paul's manipulation. It was just his trickery and his deceitful way of getting the Corinthians money without the Corinthians knowing it. In other words, some may have accused Titus of as being a co-conspirator, taking money, uh, uh, feigning to be taking it to delivering it to the poor saints in Jerusalem, but eventually giving it to Paul. Well, Paul says that this is just a conspiracy. That th this is just a theory that has no fact or no motivation whatsoever. And he, he defends this and he, he makes the argument in several ways. And I'm only going to list a few here. But first of all, when money was collected and was sent to the poor saints in Jerusalem, Paul made sure the funds were carefully guarded by sending that, those funds by Titus and also another brother. This other brother is not mentioned. It may be Luke. It may be Barnabas. Some, we really don't know who exactly it is, but whoever it was, it was someone that the Corinthians had a great deal of trust in and uh, a respect for that would confirm that the funds indeed would go exactly to where they were intended to go, 2 Corinthians 8.18. And chapter 12, verse 18. But secondly, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, 8 and 9 that he robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. In other words, Paul says that I did not take funds from the Corinthians because he did not want them to accuse him of preaching for money. But then third, while many people like to boast on their successes and their strengths, Paul did just the very opposite. Paul said, my boasting is in my weakness. Now, how many people do you know that do that? How many people take pleasure and in, in, in glory in their infirmities? In 2 Corinthians 11, verses 20 through 30, Paul gives a long list of the sufferings that he endured. Now, con artists won't do that. Uh, they, they boast in their, uh, their successes, but never in their failures and their weaknesses. And yet, Paul did all of this for the sake of the church. But fourth, an interesting statement is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verses 1 through 4, where Paul talks about how that he was caught up in paradise and heard unspeakable words which is not lawful for a man to utter. And he received abundant revelations whereby a person might be exalted above measure, um, verse 7. Now again, these are not the words of a manipulative con artist, uh, but of a man who has given up everything for Christ and his church. And then finally, in 2 Corinthians 12, 12, Paul talks about how that truly uh, he had the signs of an apostle which were wrought among you in all patience and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. God would not endorse a lying, stealing thief by giving him the power of an apostle to perform miracles. The fact is anybody can make charges. Anybody can come up with accusations. But the fact remains Paul had never beguiled or tricked the Corinthians uh, ever. Everything that he did, he did above board. Thank you for this good question. Appreciate that. That was an unusual question. I appreciate that good answer. To Brother Nat Evans, does God view one sin any greater or worse or more harshly than another? Brother Evans. First, my answer is not designed to enumerate every sin nor to specifically put them in a category or categories. We have different ones mentioned in Galatians 5, 19 to 21, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, 
those who practice those things and such like will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. I'm proceeding on a scriptural precedent in trying to answer this question, and that is evidence by Psalm chapter 19, verses 12 to 14, where David mentions four different kinds of sin, secret sins, presumptuous sins, sins of the heart, and sins of the tongue. Now, none of these sins are good. Any and all sin unrepented of and un is not taken care of by the cleansing blood of Christ will cause a man to be lost in the day of judgment, 2 Corinthians 5.10. Matthew Henry once said, There is no sin little because there is no little God to sin against. Yet insofar as the consequences of sin in this life, we all surely can admit that there is surely a difference in a personal, private sin committed through ignorance, weakness, or inadvertence. And the terrible atrocities committed by Theodore Ted Bundy, the notorious serial killer of past years, and then also a difference between that private sin committed through ignorance, weakness, inadvertence, and the notorious sins, crimes that were committed on 9-11 in the destruction of the Twin Towers and the loss of so many lives. The Bible speaks of greater sins, John 19-11. The Bible repetitiously affirms the fact of greater sins, Amos 5-12, Lamentations 1-8, 2 Kings 17-21, 2 Samuel 24-10, 1 Chronicles 21, 8, Exodus 32, 21, 30, and 31. That there are degrees in sin can be seen in the, the three most frequently used words to describe sin that are found in the Old Testament. Again, the fact that the Bible speaks of greater sins does not mean that some sins are consequential and others are inconsequential. That some sins are big and black and others are innocently white. No grain of sand is small in the mechanism of a watch. A tiny spark during dry weather can cause a great forest fire. For example, under the Old Testament, every transgression and every disobedience received a just recompense of reward in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. But how do we view sins? We sometimes view adultery and stealing and murder as big sins, whereas we think of envy, jealousy, and gossip, we think of them as little sins. The fact that the Bible speaks of greater sins does not mean that some sins are venial and some are mortal. Catholic theology says that some sins are mortal, bringing death to the soul while other sins are venial, from the Latin venia, meaning grace, favor, or kindness, and thus can be forgiven by God's grace. All sin is mortal in that any sin that's not taken care of by the blood of Christ will cause one to be lost. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. Or James 1, 13 to 15, or the soul that sinneth it shall die, Ezekiel 18, 20. Furthermore, when one obeys the gospel, all his past sins are taken care of by the blood of Christ. And furthermore, still, when one sins as a child of God, which we are taught that every child of God occasionally does, 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 10, if we will repent of those sins, confess those sins, and pray for forgiveness, those sins can be remitted in our life as children of God. So we need to understand that there were sins involved in Hebrews 10, verse 26. For example, if one turned his back uh, as a child of God on the, against the only perfect sin sacrifice of Jesus Christ and his blood and decided to return to the Mosaic laws, being influenced by Judaizing teachers, if he remained in that state, there would be no more sacrifice for sins, because only the blood of Christ can take care of the sin 
problem. Then the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit was recognized by the Lord as being more serious than others. Matthew 12, Mark 3, and Luke chapter 12. So one can harden his heart against sin. As Benjamin Franklin said, it is true that no one can re receive remission of sins after death, but he said it is thus taught also in the Word of God that before physical death all cannot turn to the Lord, not because the Lord would forgive them, not forgive them if they did, but because they so hardened their hearts against the truth that they would not return to God and receive forgiveness lest they would be unforgiven. So we see that there are different types of sin discussed in the Bible and the consequences of sin are different. Thank you for this good question. Thank you to Brother Ferguson and Brother Evans. Brother Evans for doing such a great job today in uh, answering these good questions. Uh, we're going to have a screen at the end where you're going to see our contact information where you can send us your question. We'd like to answer that on a future program of A Bible Answer. We're wanting to advertise all throughout this month an area-wide gospel meeting. This gospel meeting will be held at the Luther F. Carson Four River Center, 100 Kentucky Avenue in Paducah, Kentucky. And this meeting is sponsored by congregations of the Churches of Christ throughout Western Kentucky. It will be held on the nights of August 6th, 7th, and 8th. That is Sunday night, Monday night, and Tuesday night. Congregational singing begins at 6 p.m. each evening. The sermons begin at 7 o'clock. Each evening there will be a lesson that will be presented by Cliff Goodwin from Aronaton, Alabama. Brother Goodwin's an outstanding gospel preacher. I know that you will enjoy hearing his lessons each night. And then that will be followed by a panel question and answer session moderated by me. And I appreciate the invitation by brethren in West Kentucky to invite me to come up and be involved in this area-wide gospel meeting. And I'm looking forward to it very much. And I'm hoping to see you there August 6th, 7th, and 8th. I think it will be a wonderful occasion, a spiritual feast, edifying to all that are in attendance. We expect a large crowd in a beautiful location. So make your plans now to attend August 6th, 7th, and 8th. Thanks for watching A Bible Answer today. And remember, for your Bible questions, there's always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for A Bible Answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the faithful Church of Christ in your area.